does come in very strongly when it comes to in-kind, uh, in-kind support. The Malaysian public is sort of overly generous and supportive. Um, when it comes to financial support, uh, it is a lot more difficult. And so for us, it's it's uh, definitely using social media platforms. And uh, an example of that would be, for example, this, uh, not Fuji School, but another organization I work with, and they too work with refugees. They have a piece of land, and they've decided now to cultivate Misai Kuching tea. And so what they're doing is they're starting a social enterprise where all the profits are generated back into the initiative, so they're not 100% so they're not reliant. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this, the, this push is necessary because the NGOs have to become more independent and more self-reliant. They need to be smarter, not welfare states, right. welfare-driven, but business-driven. So in, there is in terms a need for a new way of uh, financing. Uh, yes. Dato, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Are you observing uh, perhaps best practices in your work that mm -hmm. Malaysia could follow? Yeah. Uh, my organization involved in building human resource capacity to manage healthcare system. And um, we operate in about 20 countries at the moment to provide the support. Uh, our source of income or source of funding come from two main areas, not only for us, but other organizations as well. One is international donors. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, the international, big international donors, for example, World Bank, OSHAID, and also GIZ. These are the major players in this area. And many of the NGOs were actually uh, uh, involved in being appointed as the agent of change by this organization. They have a lot of resources. Uh, that's one area, which is very good. Good amount of resources are available. But the issue is that sometimes they are not neutral. They have their own interests. One uh, NGO or one uh, donor from, say, an X country come in and, and appoint an NGO in our country to, to, to deliver certain things, they have something that they want you to follow. Mm. You must buy equipment from their country. You must employ their consultants. Although we already have our trained consultant who can actually do a better job than them. And there, there, are, there are other things. They are also not neutral in the sense that sometimes they are linked to a private entity behind them. So uh, I'm doing a lot of work on open source software. So they will ask them, they will, they will actually entice this country to take in software which is actually developed by their, play, by their organization, which is not open source. And during that period, you'll get the system running. But at the end of the, of the period, after the, the uh, project finish, you want to continue, you've got to pay a huge amount of resources and the whole program collapse. So these are the things that we need to uh, be careful. The second source of uh, 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 sort of uh, funding is coming from the corporate sector. We have to be careful again. Corporate sector, they have a lot of money, but again, they are not neutral. Mm -hmm. In the health sector, as you know, we have a lot of code of ethics. We cannot get any support, or we, we wouldn't want any support from tobacco industry. There's no, no. There's no way. Any CSR from tobacco industry, we know that the interest is to promote people from smoking, to actually promote more smoking, and this will create these issues. So sometimes, some NGOs get enticed because the resources are a lot. And it's great trouble in our system. So these are the challenges that we are facing, and I think this is real, and we need to actually find better solution for all this. One of the biggest challenges, I think, is not just the giving, but holding these organizations accountable. So yeah. one of the challenges that I, I always tell private donors, even if it's 10 ringgit, if it's 50 ringgit, I think it's, it's, it's really important that you take an interest in, in holding them accountable, even for the 10 ringgit. So I ask my friends, you've given, you know, whenever it's like Deepavali or, or Chinese New Year or, or even Hari Raya, go out and give food and all that to these orphanages, and a lot of them are overstocked, one, two, mm -hmm. how accountable do you hold them? Do you actually check what are they doing? Do you actually go and get involved? And I think this is something that I would love the Malaysian public to change that mindset, not just from going to give, but also take a very keen interest Right from the bigger NGOs, they have good boards. They have, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're very well governed. But these small NGOs, you know, these these pachi machi NGOs as I call them, they're great people. They're wonderful people. But you know, as money comes and and money corrupts, power corrupts. You know, it's important that the public actually engage with them and find out how are they doing, and. You know, so it takes more effort than on, on the part of the public. We will discuss, uh, we'll pick up from that discussion after this short break. And this is the Merdeka Award Roundtable.
Welcome back. This is the Merdeka World Roundtable. We are on the topic of non-profits in Malaysia. We were earlier discussing about how to get our non-profits to be more internationally aligned in terms of governance, in terms of transparency as well. What are your thoughts? Where are we right now? What we do is uh, we, we uh, produce reports annually. We publish our accounts in, the, in our website. So it's transparent to all our donors. So our donors know what we do, uh, how we utilize the funds that they provide us with. And uh, this helps them to be more at ease with, uh, with our activities and be more comfortable in giving even more. Okay. Yeah. I think there needs to be legitimacy to an NGO. And when I talk about legitimacy, I, it, it's on two levels. One is that there's official legitimacy, whether or not you're with ROS, as we mentioned before, or with um, security, I mean, ROC. with the ROC. Um, so there, there has to be that platform in terms of legitimacy. But there also has to be legitimacy to the mandate that you have, to the people that you serve, that you provide, that you're very clear in terms of your objectives and, and how you're going to do things. Um, and that's where the accountability comes in. And okay. That's how you know you show accountability then in terms of coming up with your reports, etc., cetera, um, return on investments, what you do with your money, what you do with the resources which are provided to you. However, also we need to point out there are increasing number of smaller uh, non-profits, sometimes it's uh, community-based, yep. uh, small, small initiatives taken by people. But how do you control, how do you manage that? So, so you want to do good work, but at the same time, you need to adhere to some sort of accountability. No, of course. And, and so, when we start, so that's why we started NGOHub.Asia, right? To be able to, A, give a platform for smaller NGOs to be able to, to portray themselves to the greater public. Um, and the whole idea was also the rating system. So you know how when you have a trip advisor and you sort of rate the hotel and you hold them accountable? Um, we thought that this would be a great way using the power of social media, which is so evident in today's mm -hmm. times. Um, to be able to then rate and, and tell the community what they think about that NGO. Uh, and it also gives the, and, and sometimes you know you do have naysayers who will mm -hmm. simply criticize, but it gives the organization a chance to explain itself and to show its values. And um, it's actually been uh, something that has been very, very um, successful for us. And just give know. us a bit of background of NGO Hub Asia. It's an online platform yes. to match uh, so, professionals? So, yes, no. So NGO Hub Asia has four objectives. The first is to allow smaller NGOs to profile themselves. Mm -hmm. So A, we first verify that they're legally registered. Uh, they've been operational for a year because a lot of people register and they're not operational. Um, the second thing besides profiling themselves is to be able to recruit volunteers so they can, they can put out their jobs or oh, I need this. for So however sh long or short, it could be a one-day session, it could be a six-month placement. Uh, the third thing is to be able to list their events, um, so the different programs they're running. And the fourth thing is we offer small grants so they can apply uh, for small grants, which is really what a lot of these smaller NGOs need. They just need that three to 5,000 ringgit worth of grants, beds, mattresses, first aid kits, school bags, you know, and making sure that we can sort of provide that little support. Um, so these are the four things that NGOHub.Asia does directly. Indirectly is when the rating system comes into play. It's into the ability to be able to bring, uh, so we've brought actually media attention to smaller NGOs because now there's this platform that the people can go to and see uh, a whole range of uh, NGOs, and it's not just the small ones, the, okay. a lot of big ones are there as well. Now here's the thing, we have about 77,000 NGOs and POs in Malaysia, that makes it about one f uh, NGO for about every 500 Malaysian. Is that too much, and do we have too many NGOs around? Yeah. What does it do to the NGO <laughs> community when it comes to really serving the people? Yeah, if I said earlier, uh, NGOs is an important entity in, in, our, in our system to support whatever is uh, being done by the government to provide services and all that. But on the other hand, we have to be careful because some our NGOs are creating more problems than what we anticipate. For example, now, Malaysia, we're having a diphtheria outbreak. What's the reason for that? This is because there is a group of people who are against the vaccination. And these are the NGOs who actually have a very good platform, social media, they influence everybody. It creates a lot of problems in the community. And, and as a result, we have outbreaks here and there, which actually very difficult. So we need a strong control. If we don't have a strong control, we end up with this. Because some of these uh, NGOs don't have a technical capacity to advise people on certain things, but they go beyond that. They, was, they were distributing information which are not right, and this creates a very adverse situation in the community. These NGOs do do a disservice because they create a, uh, an, an atmosphere of mistrust. Yes. And once society starts, we like to blanket ban things. So once we mis start mistrusting, we tend to just paint everything with the same brush. 
and then everyone gets affected as well. So that's it's an important point to point out. I think when Fuji School first started, we didn't set up an institution, we weren't legal, we weren't formal. We just stumbled along. We saw a need, we had a we came together as individuals, young Malaysians wanting to help, and we started something. Along the way, we realized, okay, we're gonna be here for a while. We need to get our act together. So it was that internal pressure that said, we need to get our act together. We need to be more formal, structured. We need to be, put processes in place because if we're taking public funds, we need to be responsible for public funds. We need to be responsible for what we're spending on. Um, and I think that's a very, that's as, as an NGO, it's a very, important self-regulation you have to put on yourself. Okay. But I think it's interesting that with social media, you see a lot of crowdfunding sites popping up. You see a lot of young individuals around the world who are starting, and it's not an NGO per se, but maybe this is the 21st century of an NGO, initiatives that are, that are garnering, raising tons of money, mm. uh, lending support to causes all over the world, and having impact and changing lives. Now one and good example that I want to point out was, the, if you guys recall, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge mm -hmm. uh, to raise awareness for the uh, Lou Gehrig's mm. disease. In the US alone, it raised over $100 million from 3 million donors. That is just an example of how social media or the internet can help mobilize that kind of uh, resources. Do you see NPOs here utilizing that to their best advantage? I think it's difficult. I think a lot of NGOs attempt to do similar, um, similar things, but it is, it's a short-term effect because Yes, people raised a lot of money, but in terms of awareness and the outputs from that money, you don't know what's happened and people have moved on to the next mission. When it comes to donor, I think you need to have donor retention as well. People need to believe in the cause that you have so that there is continuous donation and so that it's not just giving money um, for the sake of giving money, but it's giving money for change and change not just in the environment around you, but within yourself as well that you actually take positive action, be it for cancer, that you, know, you give money because yes, you, know, you're, you see people suffering from cancer and you want to help them, but there's that understanding as well that you could be impacted by cancer yourself, your community is going to be impacted by cancer. How do I do that change? How do I make that change so that we can prevent cancer overall? So I think there has to be a greater responsibility from the public in why we give money and how do we take ownership of that money that we give. So there is lack a sense of accountability in the money perhaps the public uh, give, yes. but what is driving that? What is the it's root cause of the problem I mean, here? the issue I think is that people give money for emotional reasons. It's not subjective in the sense, it, it, it's not based on logic. Corporations, yes. You know, corporations, it's easier to manage in the sense that you're giving um, and they're looking, they're looking at the transparency, the accountability of the organization. But for individuals, you're giving because of that emotive cause. You mm -hmm. see a child suffering with cancer, I want to give money. Oh. Um, and you don't actually look into what is that money going to be used for um, how is it going to impact that child? Is it going to help or is it not? No. Okay. Um, All right, please continue. No, so I think it's important for the general public um, to take that responsibility as well. Okay. Um, to we, we talk about governance of NGOs, um, how we should be self, um, self-governing. Um, Datho said that you know we need to have more governance, maybe in terms of official governance, but I think governance also comes from the person. It comes from the individual who gives the money. Um, and that, that is incredibly important for us to mature um, in the NGO world. One of the main reasons projects fail, especially development projects, is particip participatory lack of it. Um, we go into communities, we think we're here, we're here to save the day and bring you clean water and we've not engaged properly with them, we've not, had, we've not shared understanding, we don't understand their situation, and so projects fail. Um, and you see so many situations, a case, a case in Cambodia where you had two or three different uh, NGOs all dealing with water, mm -hmm. throwing wells and throwing all types of water filtration systems to certain communities. And you'd go there and you'd see two competing wells next to yeah. each other, one's broken. Um, you know, you'd see systems, like was mentioned earlier, that they had not been given proper workshops and training, mm -hmm. so they were using them all wrong. And so I think, yes, you need to get money like from, say, the crowdfunding or from more sensational forms of like fundraising, but at the end of the day, it does come down to, in the case of Cambodia, certain NGOs on the ground who play a very strong role in, they're there for the long haul. 
they do the work that no one else wants to do. I want to give one example when you mentioned about Cambodia. This uh, involved international donors, two, two different organizations. Uh, Cambodia has got a lot of problems with the water supply. So one uh, uh, international donors provide the funding for them to dig the uh, well and use the pump system. It was well. They, they, they built so many uh, tube wells and they've been used for many. Uh, but after a few years, we found that people start getting the skin problem. And what happened was that the water was not tested for arsenic. Yeah. And arsenic was actually found to be very highly uh, uh, available in all the water uh, tables, except for three or four districts only. So what happened was that we have to do another ways, another uh, mechanisms, and then we work with another NGO to actually close down the pump and then build some other mechanism. So one NGO go and build the pump five years later, another NGO have to actually make a campaign for people not to use the water. So these are two contradictory yeah. issues. The thing is because we, there's, no, there's no coordination. A lot of money has been wasted and people die from cancer. You know, arsenics cause uh, liver cancer, right. they cause skin cancer and many other uh, conditions. Dr. I want to follow up yeah. on that uh, point on coordination among mm. different organizations and that we will discuss after uh, this short commercial break and you've been watching the Mudega Award Roundtable. Stay tuned, we'll be back shortly.